the implementation of our array-based list today. Uh, and then we're going to look at a stack. Now, if you're in CISC 124, you're basically going to get the stack lecture a second time, this time in C. So it's the same lecture again. Uh, it's not quite the same lecture, but um, you're going to implement a stack using nodes, uh, this time uh, in C. Okay, so the, there's only two functions left in this list class. Uh, sorry, this list uh, data structure that we're implementing in C. The first one is a function that takes a list, so T, and it's going to uh, give you back the string representation of that list, right? So it's going to give you back the representation the same way you get it in Java. Uh, so the idea here is uh, you, uh, you, in this function, we want it to return a string that looks like something like the following, right? So you want the opening square bracket, and then you want the elements of the list. So these are just ints in our implementation, um, followed by commas and spaces, right? So say something like one, and then minus two, and then three, and then da, 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 whoop, closing square bracket, right? Now this is C, so I need the null terminator at the end, right? So I need the string that looks like that, right? Or more, I guess more precisely, I need a car array that can store the contents of this list. Right? So how's this going to work? So we're going to start out with um, our simple case. If the size of the list is zero, then I just want to return a pair of square brackets and the uh, null terminator. Right? So I want uh, that right? and the null terminator. So sprintf will put the null terminator in uh, for you. Right? Now I need, a, I need a string or I need a buffer, uh, sorry, a car array to print that string into. Right? So I need a string of size three. Right, opening square bracket, closing square bracket, and then null terminator. Right. So the case where the size of the uh, list is zero is pretty straightforward. When the list is not size zero, it's more complicated. Right. And the reason it's more complicated is, is uh, you, have to, you don't know how big that uh, array is that you need um, until you actually print the characters in it. Right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do something very strange here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an array that's definitely big enough to hold the contents of the list. Right? So how do you do that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allocate an array right, that has room for the opening square bracket right? and then has room for the longest int that I can possibly print in there, right? followed by a comma, followed by a space, right? And I need a t size of those, right? So in other words, I'm going to uh, allocate a buffer that's probably too big, right? Because I'm uh, these are going to be the largest possible ints that I can print in there, right? And now the problem is, is what is the largest possible int, right? So in C, that's a problem because in C, C doesn't say what the size of an int is, right? It just says that the size of an int has to be at least as big as the size of car or something like that, right? It doesn't actually say, the standard doesn't say how many bits are in an int, are in an int right? And so what I have to do is I have to compute how big is the longest int, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a temporary string, right, called temp, right? It's got 100 characters in it, so this is almost certainly big enough to store an int, right? Uh, 100 characters is a lot, is a lot of digits. Right, so that will probably suffice for the next, who knows, hundreds, hundred of years anyway. Right? And I'm now going to print the largest int into that buffer. Right? So by the largest int, I mean the int that takes up the most number of spaces. Right? And so it turns out that int is a negative number because it includes the minus sign. Right? And so you want the negative number that has the largest magnitude, which in C happens to be called int min. So I'm going to print one of those into this buffer here temp, right? And then I'm going to figure out how long is that string. So that's string length of temp. Yeah, question? Why do you use the uh, Because uh, our, this, our particular list implementation is storing, uh, is a list of int. Yeah. If it was a different type, you'd have to print a different type in there. Yeah. Right. Okay, and now the string length function tells you how long a string is, right? Uh, not including the null terminator. Right, so in other words, it tells you how many non-null characters there are in a string, right? And so that, so this max int length, that's the length of the longest possible int, right?
right? And now I can allocate space for t size of those, right? So max int length plus two, uh, sorry, so max int length is this, plus one plus two, right, is the length of that, right? And I want t size of those, right? Then I want uh, the opening and closing square bracket, right? And remember, I also want the null terminator, but the last int doesn't have the comma or the space, right? So I actually have two extra characters already in this um, string. So, in other, so this is fine. This is definitely big enough to hold uh, the longest possible string that you can generate from this list. Right, now if all of that seems unnecessarily complicated, it is, but that's just the way it is in, in C. Right? Uh, I guess most implementations would not do this, so they wouldn't try to compute the string length here. Uh, they'd probably assume it's some certain length and just go with that, right? If you're being very cautious, this is the way, uh, this is one way you might do it, right? Okay, now I've got space for all of the stuff in my string, so now you just write a loop and you print stuff into the string using sprintf, right? So remember sprintf, that's just formatted print that prints into a string, right? So I'm gonna start by printing the opening square bracket followed by the first element of the list and now the loop is gonna print comma, space, next element of the list, comma, space, next element of the list, comma, space, next element of the list. Right, and so here's my loop. Right. Oh, there's something here, uh, right. All right, so how does sprintf work? Right. So sprintf takes in a pointer, p, right, so that's gonna be a pointer into a uh, character array where you're going to print. Right. So normally when you use, uh, normally when you print into a an array, sorry. So normally when you print into an array, you're gonna start printing at the front of an array. Uh, but in this case, we need to keep track of where we are in the array. Right, so here's my giant array. There's P, right? So that's the pointer I'm gonna pass into sprintf. So sprintf will start printing here into this array, right? At the beginning of the array, right? sprintf returns the number of characters that it prints. So I need N, right? So in other words, if it prints five characters into this array, then the next time I print into the array, I need to remember to move P to P plus five. So I need the value n, and then I move p. So in this case here, suppose we print, uh, what am I printing, square bracket and something. So I print the square bracket, and then let's say the number negative one. Right? The next time, so in the loop when I call printf, uh, s printf again, I need to move p so that it points to the next character to print at. Right, so that's p plus n. Right, so n's the number of characters that were printed by printf, uh, s printf, right, p plus n uh, moves the pointer p uh, down the array so that the next call to s printf starts printing from here. Right, so again in the loop, printf, uh, s printf again, right, this time I just print, this time I'm printing the comma, the space, and then the value. Right, the value that you're printing is just the element in the array at index i. Right, n's the number of characters that get printed. So again, at the end of the loop, just advance p uh, by uh, n spaces. Right. So again, so here, if you print the comma, then the space, and then say 100, right, then you want to advance this to here. Right, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right, so now you gotta keep track of a pointer in this array um, to remember where you're going to start printing at next. Right, and so that's how the, um, oh, and that, at the end you print the closing square bracket. Right, and then finally when you're done that, you can return the, the string s. Right, now if you want to, right, remember how we computed s to begin with, right, so s, our string, Right, we made a string or an array 
uh, that can hold a very large, that the, can hold the largest possible list when you convert it to a string, right? Uh, the largest possible string for the list, right? Which is probably, well, it's almost certainly too big, right? So if you want to shrink the size of the string, right, or the size of the array, uh, you can use realloc here to shrink the size of the array uh, down to the size of the string. Right? So if you want to do that, you can. I'm not doing it here. Right? But then you can return s. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, you are going to miss Java's two string. Right? Because this is what you have to do when you want to generate the string representation of anything um, in C. Right? All right, any questions there? Yes? Yep, right here? Because in C, you don't actually, uh, so depending on the platform that you are compiling for, the size of int can change, right? It might be 32 bits, it might be 64 bits. You might have some really bizarre computer where it's like 72 bits, which would be unusual, but it could, it could happen, right? C doesn't specify the size of any of its types, right? So I don't actually know how many characters the longest possible int is going to be, right? So if I don't know that, I have to compute it, right? So the way to compute it is to print the largest possible, the longest possible int, right, into an array, and then figure out how long that string is, right? So here I'm assuming that the largest possible int takes up less than 100 characters, right? Which is probably true, um, but uh, even that has no guarantees. It's almost certainly true, though. Yep. Why do you need two? Oh, so you could use it. So uh, I, I use two here to make it easier to read. You don't actually need two. Uh, that's not true. Uh, because I have to return, I need to return the pointer to the first character in the array at the end, right? Uh, so if I just adjust s every time, and then I won't be able to return s at the end of the function. Okay. Yep. Yep. What is n? n? So s print f. There's s print f. Right. So number three. So we go look at number three. Blah 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 blah. It doesn't tell you what it returns. Go down here. Past all this stuff here. Blah blah blah. blah. Not the uh, easiest function in the world to use, by the way. Number three, number of characters written to the buffer, not counting the null terminating character. So it tells you how many characters sprintf wrote into the array, right? So if it writes one, two, three characters into the array, I need to advance the pointer three elements to the right, yeah. All excellent questions, right? Any other questions? You should have questions, yes, <laughs> okay. I use malloc once, right? So I use malloc to store the string that I want to return. So whatever I do, I, in this function, I should not free that array because then the person who gets the return pointer won't be able to use it. Whoever gets this string has to free it. And that's the other problem in C, right? It's very easy to forget, oh, I have to free this pointer that I got back from this function, right? And then if you don't free it, you end up with a memory leak. Right? So it's very easy to forget that uh, this function did in fact mal uh, allocate some memory and that as the caller of the function, I have to free this memory. Yeah. Yes? Right. Uh, so imagine that the longest int is that, right? Whatever that is, I don't, it's prob I don't know how long it actually is. Um, so when I generate this string, right, I've got n of these, right, where n is the number of elements in the list, but I also have a comma and a space after each one, except the last one, right? So number, comma, space, number, comma, space, number, comma, space, right? So that one is what I call it? That is max int length. Right? That's two. Right, and I need um, how many? T size of those. I actually need T size minus one of those, 
right? Uh, plus another one of these, right? Because I don't need the comma and the space at the for the last uh, for the last element, right? But I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use that comma and a space to store the null terminator. <laughs> so it's uh, extra complicated here. All right. Any other questions? All right. The next one's worse. So. <laughs> So the next one is uh, this version of list to string. This one takes a list t, and now someone gives you an array to print into. They don't actually give you an array. What they give you is they give you a pointer into an array, right? So that's this pointer here, right? So whoever calls this function is responsible for supplying the array to print into, right? And they're going to tell you how big is that array, right? So they're going to pass in the array called buff or buffer and they're going to tell you how big that array is, and that's buffer size, right? And now you can print into that buffer, right? But what you have to be careful about when you do this is you can't go past the end of their buffer, because if you go past the end of their buffer, bad things are going to happen, right? You're going to overwrite some of their data. Right? So this one becomes a little bit more complicated. Okay, so if the buffer that they give you is size zero, you can't do anything. Right? Oh, sorry. This function returns the number of characters that are printed into the buffer, not including the null terminator. Right? So in other words, you're going to tell them, uh, you're going to give them something that's related to the length of the string that you printed. Right? So that's what we're going to return there. All right. So if they give you a length, uh, zero length buffer, there's nothing you can do. Right? You can't print anything. So I'm just going to return zero. All right. Now I need to keep track of how many characters can I actually print into the buffer. I have to remember that there's a null terminator at the end. So the number of characters that I can print into the buffer are buff size, right, minus one. Minus one for the null terminator, right? Okay, I'm now going to keep track of how many characters are remaining in the buffer. So that's buff size. Oh, sorry, that's buff, rema buffer, uh, buff remaining. All right, so I got those two things there. And I'm going to keep track of how many characters are printed into the buffer already. Right, so that's n buff. n buff, number of characters written to the buffer. Buff remaining, that's the number of characters that are, uh, I can print, uh, that I have available to print into the buffer. Okay. Now, uh, the problem with sprintf is it takes a value, or it takes whatever, uh, so it takes a conversion string and then it takes an argument, it converts that thing into using your conversion string and then just prints that many characters into the, str uh, into the buffer. Right? So in other words, sprintf can print an arbitrary number of characters into a buffer. Right? And it uh, doesn't tell you how many it's printed until it's done. Right? If you don't give it enough space, it just goes past the end of your buffer. Right? So if you give it a, an array of size 3 and it prints 50 characters, then it goes 47 characters past the end of your array, right? which is not a good thing. Right? Uh, and so if you Google sprintf online, uh, you'll see lots of advice that says don't use sprintf. Right? Unless you're sure that the buffer you're printing into has enough space. So there's a related function called snprintf. So let's look at that one. So that's that one right here. Right? So snprintf takes a buffer to write into, so that's your buffer. Right? It takes the size of the buffer. Right? And then it takes your formatting string and then it takes all of the arguments that you want to print into the buffer. Right? Uh, notice though that this one, right, snprintf, actually takes in the size of the buffer. Right? Whereas sprintf does not. Right? It takes in a pointer and that's it. Right? So it will print as many things as it wants to uh, starting at that pointer. Right? snprintf will print that minus one characters into the buffer because it always writes the null terminator at the end. Right? So snprintf is the quote unquote safe version of sprintf. Right? It's safe because you can restrict how many characters it tries to print by that second argument. Right? So this is the one I want to use. Oh, its return value is weird though. Right? So if you go down and look at the documentation, number four. Right? Now remember sprintf returns the number of characters that were printed to the buffer. SNprintf returns the number of characters that would have been printed into the buffer if the buffer size was ignored, right? So it doesn't actually run past the end of your buffer, well, if you give it the appropriate buffer size, right? 
but it will tell you how far it would have run past the end of the buffer um, as its return value. Right? So the number of characters that would have been printed if there was enough space. So keep that in mind. All right. So because the user has provided us with the buffer size, right, uh, I'm pretty sure, so we're pretty sure that we can just call snprintf with that buffer size. And we're also pretty sure that whatever value of n is returned is going to be uh, zero or positive, right? It's negative if there's an error. Um, so we're pretty sure it's not going to be negative. Right? So I'm going to start by writing the opening square bracket followed by the first element right into uh, the user into the buffer right now ends the number of characters that would have been written if there was enough space right so the number of characters that would have been used if there was enough space right I'm keeping track of that in n buff right all right now if the number of characters that were would have been printed is bigger than the amount of size that I actually have to print into, right, then I know I'm done. That's as much as I can print into the string, right? So if the number of characters that were printed or would have been printed exceeds the amount of space that I actually have, right, then I know that I used up all the space that I was given, and that's the number of characters that were printed into the buffer, right? It's still safe. This does not blow over past the end of the buffer, right, because we're telling it how big that buffer is. All right, everybody got that? So basically, there's just a bunch of bookkeeping that's going to happen here. Right? I'm going to keep track of n buff, the number of characters that are printed into the buffer, and I'm going to keep track of how many characters are left in the buffer. Right? So if I get past this if statement, right, then I know that it printed some stuff into the buffer, and there's still possibly more space in the buffer. Right? So the amount of space that's remaining is just, uh, I just subtract n from that. All right, now advance the pointer by n, right? So it's p plus n all over again, except this time it's buff plus n, right? So move the pointer to the next uh, free space in the buffer, right? And now it's the same thing all over again, except this time I'm keeping track of how many characters have been written, right? So write the next character into the buffer, right? So, sorry, write the write hmm, comma and space, followed by the next element into the buffer, right? The number of characters written is just, uh, I add n to that, right? If the number of characters that have been written into the buffer exceeds the size of the buffer, right? Then I've used up all the space in the buffer, so I'm done, right? I just return uh, the, I just ret I, and I return max n buff to tell them I've printed, I've used up all the space in your buffer. Right. If I get past the if statement, right, advance the buffer, advance the pointer, n spaces to the right, subtract n from how much space is left in the um, buffer. Right. Almost done. Right. At the end, I'm going to print the closing square bracket. Oh, right, buff remaining. Right. So that's why I'm keeping track of the size of the, of the amount of space that's remaining. Right. Every time I call, SN printf, right? I have to pass in how much space is left in that buffer, right? And so that's why we're keeping track of buff remaining. Finally, at the end, print the closing square bracket, right? Hopefully add one to n buff, right? Again, if n buff exceeds the maximum amount of space in the buffer, return the maximum space in the buffer, right? Otherwise, we just return n buff, right? And away you go. And, and uh, the caller of the function now has a string, uh, sorry, their string now has the contents of the list printed in it. Now, the way this works is, right, when you're printing stuff into that buffer, right, it never prints more than that minus one characters in the buffer, right? So if we get to the end of our buffer here, Right, so imagine that I write a comma and then a space. Right, I've now run out of. I've now run. Uh, uh, I'm now going to print the last character, or I'm going to print the next character in the in the next string uh, int in the list. 
Suppose that value is 100, right? I guess I need two here, right? So I don't have space for 100, right? So what SN printf does is it prints the one, right? It tries to print the zero and the zero, but it doesn't have space for them. So it doesn't print the zero and the zero, it just prints the one. Adds the null terminator to the end, and then returns three in this case, right? It would have, ri it would have written three characters into the buffer if it could, but it only wrote one. So the string that they get back ends prematurely, but that's because there's no space left in the buffer, right? And so when the person who, whoever calls the function, if they call it with a small buffer and the list is very long, they only get the first part of the list. They don't get all of the list. Right. All right, so let's see if all this actually works. So uh, you should have a, if you have this, uh, if you downloaded the code, you've got a little program called list demo. Uh, that actually uses the code that we just looked at. So here's list demo. Right, starts out with a list of size zero. We add a zero, so the size becomes one. And when you print the list, you get that. So this calls the first version, uh, the first two string version uh, for the list. Right, so in other words, it allocates space for a string, returns a string, I have to free the string. Right. And this seems fine, right? Everything seems to work, I can remove stuff from the list. The second time this happens, uh, starting here, right, I'm going to use the second version of the uh, function. So this is the version of the function where when I call the function, I give it a buffer to print into. Right? And I've intentionally used a buffer that's too short. Right? And so you can see that when I print the string, I don't get the whole list. Right? And that's because uh, the string that I gave the function doesn't have enough space to print the whole list into. Right? But it does work correctly. Right, I don't get any funny errors. Um, if you actually step through the code with a debugger, you'll find that it works exactly the way we want it to. Right, it doesn't go past the end of the buffer um, and it returns the appropriate, uh, it returns the correct size every time. Right, so it does in fact work. Actually both versions of uh, two string work um, the way we want them to. Right, but uh, both versions I think we'll all agree are fairly complicated to implement. Okay. Um, so that's it for the list class, or uh, for the list data structure. Um, I guess, does anybody have any questions? So I guess the, I guess one question is, is will, will I ask you this on the exam? The answer is no, you won't be asked this on the exam, right? Uh, this is way too complicated. Uh, probably too complicated as a lecture. Um, it's probably too complicated as an assignment problem. Uh, so you certainly won't see this on the exam. Um, but this is what you have to do uh, if you want to print something nicely uh, in C, right? Yeah. Here? Yeah. You could, yes. You could, but SN printf won't print, if buff remaining is zero, oh, sorry, hang on. Where's the check if n buff is greater than, yeah, so uh, it's possible that buff remaining here is zero. So it won't, yeah, yeah. It, it's fine if it's zero. So if it's zero, the documentation actually tells you what happens. Uh, if buff size is zero, nothing is written, and the buffer may be a null, uh, and buffer may be a null pointer. However, the return value uh, is still calculated in return. So it does nothing if uh, it will not print into the buffer if, if buff remaining is zero. Right. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that buff remaining is unsigned. Uh, so it'll never be negative either in this case. All right, any other questions? Okay. Uh, moving right along. I guess we should talk a little bit about make. Oh, make. Okay. Okay, so make is a build automation tool, right? So as soon as you start to build a C program that has more than an one or two files, right? So it has more than one header file and one source code file, um, it starts to become awkward to type everything in on the command line. Uh, so make is a tool that, that uh, was originally designed to build C programs. So it automatically builds programs and or libraries from source code. Now it can actually build 
uh, more than just C programs. You can actually use it to build lots of different stuff. Right. Uh, the way it works is it reads a plain text file called a make file. And that text file specifies uh, the dependencies in your source code. So I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. Um, if you want, if you're curious about the history of make, you can hit that link. Um, that Wikipedia page actually has a bunch of fun facts uh, and quotes from the creator of the make program. Uh, the documentation, you can hit that link there and I'll take you to the documentation. So a make file just tells make what to do. Right? So it's the specification for what make should do. In a simple make file, the contents of the make file consist of what are called rules. Right? So a rule looks like the following. So there's something called the target, then there's a colon, there's something called the prerequisites, right? and then there are the steps that you need to build uh, the target. Now, are we good? Do I have it here? Okay. That thing right here, which looks like four spaces, right, must not be four spaces. It must be the tab character, right? It absolutely has to be the tab character, right? So you can't put spaces here, it must be the tab. If it's not the tab, it's spaces, uh, then make doesn't work properly, right? Uh, and that's one of the quotes in the Wikipedia page. The, the creator of Make has something to say about that. Um, right. uh, and basically, he regrets doing that. Uh, but that's the way it works. Right? That's the way he designed it to begin with, and then it just got used by a lot of people, and so we're stuck with it. That has to be the tab. Okay, so for a C program, uh, uh, the first rule uh, can define how the executable program should be built. So in other words, it should define, it can define uh, how to build the program that you want, right? the final executable program, um, as the first rule. Right? So the first rule, make calls the default goal. So if you just run make on its own, then it always builds the default goal. Right? It always uses the first rule. Okay, so what are these prerequisites? Those are the files that the target depends on. Right? And the recipe is just the sequence of commands that you need to build the target given the prerequisites, right? So here's hello C, right? So for our hello one program, right? Oops, sorry, right? So for my target hello one, right? What does it depend on? Well, there was only that one source code file, right? Hello one dot C, right? So that's my prerequisite, right? So hello one depends on hello one dot C, right? If you edit hello1.c, right, and then rerun make. Make knows that it has to rerun the rule for building hello1, right? So what make does is it looks at the timestamp on the dependencies, right? So if you run make and the timestamp of the file is newer than the target, then it rebuilds the target. So in other words, it tries to detect, have you edited one of the prerequisites? If so, it rebuilds the target. Right? That's the rule for building our target. Right? So to compile hello1.c uh, into our executable hello1, it's just gcc hello1.c minus o hello1. Right? So that's just a command. It can be any command, any bash command, right? if you're running in Linux. Right? Uh, so any command here. Uh, and you can have more than one command. Right? But for uh, a C program normally to compile one source code file, it's just one command. Right. So here's another one. So that list demo program I just showed you, right? List demo depends on the compiled version of list, right? So I've got the, uh, uh, so list.c and list.h, right? And it also, in this case, the way I've written it, depends on the compiled version of list demo. Right, so it depends on this demo dot o. Right, to rebuild, oh, there we go. Right, so this demo depends on the files list dot o and this demo dot o. If one of those files needs to be rebuilt, right, then make also rebuilds this demo. Right, to assemble our program, it's just gcc minus o, name of the executable, and the two object code files here. Right, okay. Now, in most C programs, so notice what's missing here, right? What's missing here is list.h, list.c, and listdemo.c, right? So they're, in this example, they're missing intentionally because in most C programs, your prerequisites for the overall target also need to be built, right? So they also need to be compiled, right? 
So you can define separate rules on how to build list.o and list.demo.o. Right? So how do I build list.o? Well, list.o depends on list.c and list.h. Right? If either one of those change, right, then list.o gets rebuilt. Right? How do I build list.o? Well, it's just gcc minus c list.c. Right? Just compile list.c to an object file. Same thing with listdemo.o, right? Listdemo.o depends on list.h and listdemo.c. If either one of these change, right, listdemo.o gets built, right? And again, to, read, and to build that, it's just gcc minus c listdemo.c. Right? So to build the default goal, you just run make by typing in make, right? And so you'll have make on, installed on your computers if you've installed the compiler. So make reads the make file in the current directory, right? So if you type make in some directory, make looks in that directory for a make file, right? And then it builds the first target in that file, right? So before running the recipe for the first rule, make will process the rules for all the prerequisites of the first rule. So what does that mean? Right? So if you just type make, make looks at this first rule, and it says, oh, it depends on list.o and listdemo.o, right? Do these exist? If they exist and they are, uh, if they exist, oh, if they already exist, um, sorry, list.o and list.demo.o. Okay, so what's the rule for list.o? It goes down to here, right? And it sees it depends on list.c and list.h, right? If list.o exists, but one of these two files are newer, list.o gets rebuilt, right? Similarly for list.demo.o, it says, well, what does that depend on? Well, it depends on that and that, right? If one of these two files are newer than that, right, then this gets rebuilt, right? And then finally, now that that's built and that's built, it can go ahead and build list.demo, right? So now it can run that command right there, right? So if a target already exists, make rebuilds the target only if the prerequisites for the target are newer than the target, right? So here we go. So here's our make file for our list demo program, right? If I li edit list.c, uh, sorry, list.h, right? So in other words, if I edit list.h, list.o gets rebuilt, right? If you edit list.h, right, it's also a prerequisite for listdemo.o, so listdemo.o gets rebuilt, right? And now, right, listdemo depends on those two files, they were just rebuilt. So list demo also gets rebuilt, right? Uh, so make tries to uh, make sure that all of the dependencies in your program get built in the appropriate order. Right? Um, and it's handy as, uh, well, it's, it's handy um, as soon as your programs start to become bigger than just one or two files. Okay, so there are things called phony targets in make. Right, so a phony target is one that's not the name of a file. Right, notice here, list demo, that's the name of a file. Right, that's the name of our executable program. Right, list.o, that's the name of the compiled list.c program. Uh, sorry, source code file. And listdemo.o, that's just the name of the compiled listdemo.c file. Right, so you're allowed to make up fake targets, so targets that don't correspond to a file. Right, if you want to build one of these, you have to specify the name of the target. So here's an example of a phony target. Right? Uh, in a lot of make files, you'll see that there's a target called clean. Clean cleans up all of the object files and all of the uh, targets. Right? So in other words, it deletes listdemo.o, list.o, and listdemo.o. Right? Uh, and the reason you sometimes want to do this is because uh, you want to rebuild everything from scratch. Right? So you want to force um, make to rebuild everything from scratch. So you just nuke everything in the directory. Well, you nuke all the built stuff in the directory, right? And so clean has no dependencies. When you type make clean, it just executes that command there. Right. Uh, and so that's the quick and dirty introduction to make. If you're interested in using make uh, for a more complicated project, um, then I encourage you to read the documentation. Now, if any of you end up working in uh, an open source C or C++ program or perhaps in research, or if you're doing research for somebody in the department, right, there's a good chance you're gonna run into make or one of the related tools. Uh, there's a newer tool called CMake, 
um, which is a little bit uh, which is a little different, but it does the same. It does something similar, right? Uh, so they are commonly used tools. You probably don't have to use it so much in this course because we never really build any big pieces of software here. You can probably get away just by typing in GCC something. Um, uh, but it is handy to have around. And it is useful to know as soon as you start to program uh, bigger and bigger, work on bigger and bigger projects. Yeah. All right, uh, do we have time? Yeah, let's start the stack stuff. Okay, is anybody here did not know what a stack is? Okay, that's good. So I can skip most of the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so we know all about this stuff, right? You know there's push and pop. You know how push and pop works, right? You know how to reverse an array, maybe. Okay. Uh, right. So how do you implement a stack not using an array, right, but instead using a bunch of nodes, right? Uh, anybody here not know what a node is? Good. All right, so, so a node in a stack uh, is going to store an element of the stack, right? A little bit later on, we're going to change that. So we're going to make it store a pointer to an element, right? Each node is also going to have a pointer to the next node deeper in the stack, right? So here's a picture of a node, right? So our node is going to store the element one, right? The arrow here, that's the pointer to the next node in the stack, right? So this is the top of the stack. So that pointer points at nothing, right? In Java, it's little n u l l. In C, it's big n u l l, right? So there's your element, there's your link, right? If I want to push an element onto the stack, right? You make a new node. Right? and you store the element in the node, right? you then set the link of the new node to point to the current top of the stack. Right? So I make that point there. Right? Then you move top, so that top points to the new top of the stack. Right? And then if you're keeping track of the size of the stack, you add one to the stack size. Right? To pop an element off the stack, when you pop an element, you're supposed to return the element back to the caller. So I'm going to remember that the number three is on top of the stack. Right? I'm going to set top to now point to the next element in the stack. Right? So in other words, I want top to point to the two. Right? And the way we're going to do this is, right? so if top points to this node here, and this node has a pointer to this node here, right? then I can just set top to equal that pointer there, right? Because that pointer points to the two anyway, right? And then uh, the top node, that's going to disappear, so we'll have to see how we deal with that and see, right? You're going to subtract one from the stack size because we just removed an element from the stack, and then I'm going to remember that I had the three, so I'm going to return that three back to the caller, right? All right, so let's see how this works in C. And I didn't open it. Somewhere there's, where's my stack? I was just in 20, wasn't I? Yeah, I was. It's not here. Oops, sorry. Find dot minus name stack dot h. Okay, oh, generic, well, that's not good. Do I have the old one? Okay, this is, let me quickly check if this is the one I want. And if it's not, it's quarter after anyway, so we'll just end there. All right, it's not the one I want. So let's stop there and pick this up in the next class. Yeah, it's Voidstar. <laughs>